Well, I'm reminded, uh, you know, when I was a, a teenager, at some stage my mom said this, now, you know, it sounds better in Afrikaans, so I'm trying to translate it, it's a translated version into English, where she said, show me your friends, then I will tell you who you are. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is that Rick Warren has reminded us, if we spend time in the Word of God, we will become like God. If we hang out with God, we will have His character or characteristics. If we hang out with the world, we will have the characteristics or the flavor of the world. And, and I know sometimes we go into debates and say, yes, I know, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. There's a big difference. And I'm amazed by Jesus. When Jesus came to earth, he always honored his father. He mingled with sinners, yet he never sinned. And I'm amazed many times with myself how easily I get tempted, how easily I give in. How easily I follow the ways of the world instead of focusing and following the ways of God. Now our, our vision says, of our church says, we want to be more like Jesus. And you know, we can say it, but the question is, if people from the outside look into us, look to our church or look at our lives, will they be able to see Jesus in our lives? It's not a matter of how much I say it, it's a matter of how much I practice it so that people can, can see. And Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 8 verse 31, he said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. In other words, if you obey my teaching, if you hear my teaching and if you do what I teach you, you are truly my disciples. And if I ask you this morning, how many of us would really love to be disciples of Jesus? Most of us would raise our hands because that's what we believe to the core of our being. But the question is, do we hold to his teaching? Do we live according to his teaching? In Psalm 119 verse 20, it says, this, the psalmist has this deep desire. He says, my soul is consumed with longing for your laws. At all times. This guy is restless. Day and night. You want to spend time with God. You want to be in the word of God. You want the word of God to become part of him so much. That whenever he opens his mouth. People must hear God. He says it consumes. His soul is consumed. He has a hunger. He has a longing. He has a deep desire for God's word. Not just Monday. Not just Tuesdays. Not just Sunday mornings or when we meet at a life group. He says, every single time. I don't know whether we display the same kind of hunger, but I, I have this urgency in this last 40 days, you know, last six weeks or so, to grow more in the Word of God. Now my question is, how do I integrate God's Word in my life? How, how does I make God's Word alive in me? The first thing that we need to do, we need to continue to build on the Word of God. And I, I want to ask the question, before we start building, we need to know who is our foundation. And Paul rightfully said in 1 Corinthians, he says that there is no other foundation than the foundation of Christ. There's no other way that we can be saved through Christ. Our point of departure is Christ. In order for this Word to be relevant in our lives, we must accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. Otherwise, this word will never have any meaning. So who's our foundation? Who's our authority? On whom are we going to build our faith? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 25, we all know about, you know, uh, the Beatitudes, you know, where Jesus preached, and he preached several small, shorter sh sermons, and then he wrapped it up at the end and he says this. He says, anyone who hears my words or these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. A wise man who built his house on the, on the rock. Who's your rock? Who is your rock? 
He's like a wise man. He's like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Now we know if you build on the sand, there's some consequences. If you build on the rock, you have a solid foundation. And the word of God is that rock. I quickly want to share four common foundations. Many times we build our faith not on the word of God and then there's substitutes. And we have about four substitutes which we allow in our lives on which we build our faith. The first one is popular culture. What is the in thing today? What is the in thing, whether it's a dress code, whether it's a hairstyle, whether it's cell phones, radios, sound systems, I don't know. But many times there's that in thing, there's a culture in which we are in, you know, intertwined. Is that the right word to use? And sometimes we're so part of this culture, we're so part of this popular culture that we allow the popular culture to build our faith. And we are being warned this morning not to rely on popular culture because what is popular is not always right. What is right is not always popular. You know, when I have leadership trainings with youngsters, I always make use of this phrase to remind them the popular thing will get you into trouble. Believe me. Follow the trend and you'll walk away from God. Follow the trend of the world and you won't grow in your walk with God. In Exodus chapter 23 verse 3, he said, don't follow the crowd doing wrong. The second thing is tradition. Now we know about tradition. Tradition is everywhere. It's in every church. And it's even in our church. And in Mark chapter 7 verse 8 it says, You have let go of the commands of God. And you are holding on to the traditions of men. Now Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, you know, the scribes, the guys that were the gifted guys, the learned guys, the guys with degrees. And they got so hooked in. And this, this title of them, or this position of them, the robes, and all the beautiful things that are around them, that they slowly drifted away from the commands of God. They started honoring, honoring the man system, or the you know, religious ways of man, and they slowly drifted away from having a relationship with God. Can I say something? May I? Okay. I was kicked out of the previous denomination which I belong to. I was kicked out of the church. Because I said something which I wasn't supposed to say. Now you're very curious. You wanted to know what did I say. I said, I said something like this. I said, in our congregation, it seems to me like that the church laws has a higher priority than the word of God in a sermon like this. And it was chaos. And, and I was kicked out of the church. Hallelujah. Because now I'm here with you guys. Because of tradition. Tradition is busy killing the church. And we're too afraid to address this issue. But the word of God addresses this issue. And he says, come back to the word of God and let the word of God be our ultimate authority. Even in Wolfish Bay Community Church. That's what we need to do. The third one is reason. How many of you have met people that are very, very, very clever? Clever. I want to pronounce it like that. Ne? Sometimes you meet people, they know everything. You can't tell them anything because they know everything. If you come up with this, they know a better way to do it. They always want to be the better one, the brighter one. The Okay. And, and sometimes when you reason with someone, it's, it's, it's difficult to convey the truth because he has already made up his mind. That's what he's believing and well, and that's it. Okay. Now, Proverbs warns us. He says, there is a way that seems right to a man. But the hand leads to death. Now, I just want to ask a question. If you meet someone 
like that. The Bible describes him as a fool. Okay? Now, if you argue with him, what does that make you and me? Uh, don't answer. That's just something you give for yourself. Okay? And then the fourth one, and this is the most dangerous one, it's emotions. We are being led by emotions, the way how I feel. Today I feel like this, tomorrow I don't feel like Today I feel like reading my Bible, and uh, tomorrow I don't feel like If we build our spiritual growth on how we feel, I can guarantee you, you won't grow. If I have to build, you know, my, my, my career professional ministry on how I feel, I will be, you yeah. there's so many mornings that I just feel like staying in bed. And it's probably going to be like five or six mornings out of the seven mornings. And probably it's going to be Monday to Friday because Saturday and Sunday is a little bit different. But if we build our growth, spiritual growth on how we feel, we're not, we're not going to move ground. Feelings is dangerous. Feelings can deceive us. Here's another one. Feelings can lie to you. Okay? Because if we build our, 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 even in relationships, we build on how we feel. Eh? Today I feel like loving you because you are a lovable person, so it's easy to love you. But if I don't feel like loving you, then I don't have to love you because I don't feel like loving you. Now let me, let me, let me put it into perspective. Let's say, for instance, you're in a relationship, any kind of relationship. It might even be a romantic relationship, it might be your marriage. The world formula is like this, the world formula. We see it on television being displayed everywhere. It says, you find the right person. So what do we do? We, we make a list. Even Christians, they say, you have to pray. You need to be specific. So I make a list. She must have black hair and she must have green eyes and, you know, nicely built and, and so tall and all these things, you know. And then we say, okay, at least I have a picture. Now I have to find the right person. So I look around. Oh, I spotted the right person. Cool. Now I need to fall in love with that person. Now, for men, it's easy. It's easy. You don't need anything to fall in love. If she meets your criteria and you jingle with her a little bit, you say, oh, she's so awesome. You know, I can't stand being around her. She makes me go crazy, even butterflies, all these things that goes, that goes with it. Now what you do is once you fall in love, you pursue that love. But that's a feeling love. You pursue it with everything. And you build every single, your whole purpose, your whole hope, your whole world, you build it around that person. Okay? And, when, and when you see it doesn't work, what do you do? You just repeat step one, two, and three again. So that's the world system. That's when we go, you know, according to popular culture. That's when we go and we build it on the emotions. That's when we go and, we, you know, according to tradition. We, I have to marry this because it's part of our tradition. You know, reason tells me if I do this and that and that. That's the system of the world. Now let's talk about the system, God's system, God's formula. He says... You become the right person. You don't look for that. You become the right person. It's like, you know, a f- somebody went out to look for a friend and he couldn't find a friend. You know, he went everywhere trying to look for a friend. He couldn't, friend, he couldn't find a friend. And you know what he did? He went out a second time and he said to himself, now I will be a friend to somebody. And the minute he started being a friend, he made a lot of friends. He made a lot of friends. So, so, so he's, he's, here's something key. He's talking in his own language. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at me, look at me. Don't be distracted. Just keep that thought. Just be with me. It's an urgent call. We'll give him some room. Okay. Don't lose me now. Don't lose me. That's, that's, it's emergency. Now, where were I now? <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> ah... Become the right person, yeah. So he went out to look for a friend, couldn't make a friend, but when he became a friend to somebody, he made a lot of friends. Have you experienced that? When you are a friend to somebody, how easy it is for you to make friends. You draw people to you without even knowing it because you just wanted to help that person. The second thing that in God's, how God's dimension works, he says, walk in love. Now, we want to fall in love. So sometimes we fall goof in love. And then we fall goof, out of love. Yet it says, walk, be up straight, look where you're going, walk in love. 
Now, it's, it's God's love is the agape love. It's like your problem becomes my problem because I love you. Now, in our culture, we say, what do we say? It's not your problem. We even advise people, don't get involved. It's not your problem. You know? You know, we know the story of Cain and Abel. Am I my brother's keeper? Where God asked him, where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Even today, we're still asking him. We basically say, it's not my problem. I have enough of my own problems. Can you see how different God's ways from our way? How little we have moved away from the world? Can you see why we cannot stand out in the world where people can see that we are different? And then the last step is put your hope in God. Not in the person. Put your hope in God and honor Him with your relationship. In marriage counseling, I always draw like a, a triangle, you know. God is on top, husband, wife. And the closer husband and wife moves to God the Father, the, the distance between the two of them narrows down. I believe that with all of my heart. Okay. You guys are not in a hurry. Is that, is that okay? Can I move on? Okay, I'm not going to be too long. The second one is we have to feed on the word. Colossians 3, 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Where should it dwell? Outside of you? No, inside. Let the word of God dwell richly inside of you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. The word of God needs to be in me, in me, in me, in me. Okay. Now let me quickly say, um, how, how will we do this? How will we do this? There's five ways that we can do it. The first, and Rick already taught this in, in the series. Rick Warren now when we did the, the small groups. The first one is, it's through our ears. We have to hear the word of God. The faith comes by hearing. So we have to hear it. Find ways to hear it. Being here this morning, you have an opportunity to hear God's word. Get an MP3. Load the Bible on it. You know, put it on your cell phone. MP4, CDs, DVDs, whatever you can find. But find stuff, additional stuff. So that you can listen to the word of God. We can listen to so much junk music and junk stuff instead of listening to the word of God. Can we say junk in the church? Sorry. Okay. Forgive me. But you know what saddens me? is the statistics that says. Now, I, I basically spend more, you know, more or less seven hours to prepare my sermon. It's just reading and praying and studying and, you know, Drawing conclusions and what did this one say, etc. Now I have to deliver it in a half an hour. Okay? Now here's the sad part of it. When you leave this building and you walk across the street to the parking lot, once you get into your car, you only remember five percent of what I said. Yo, isn't that a discouraging thought for a pastor who has to preach on Sundays? Luckily, I don't preach so many times. So I think too we must be even more discouraged. Okay? But 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 there's room for improvement. The second one is we have to read it. So we have to read the word of God. Eh? We have to read the word of God. Now, you heard this in with the one year, out the other year, when you read stuff, listen to it. Now it's the same thing with my eyes. It goes in with the one eye and goes out to the other eye. You read so many times, you read stuff, and then once you put it down, now what have I read again? Okay? Concentration level. So even that, it's like 5%. That's why they said the third one, which is very important, you have to do research with our hands. Bible study is when you read the Bible with a pen in your hand, when you make notes. Now, being here this morning, there's some of you that came in and you just listen. So I can tell you already now, when you go back home, you only remember 5%. Which 5 of the 5%, I don't know. Of the old message, I don't know. Or the, you know, 100%, I don't know. There's some of you that are, that are here, and most, you know, that can hear it and can also see it. There's some. So you will remember still just 5%. Oh, is that encouraging. But if you came in this morning with your word and you had a piece of paper where you make notes, whether it's a, 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 a tab or your cell phone 
or just a piece of paper or a book, if you do that, it increases the amount that you take home about 75%. Isn't that amazing? Oh, so next time when you come, bring your Bible, bring a notebook, bring a pen, and write down the, the sermons. Fourth thing, I reflect on the Word of God. Reflect means I think about it over and over and over. How many of you talk to yourself? It's normal, eh? it's normal. It's not abnormal, it's normal. Especially when, when you talk about stuff. Sometimes we, I'm like that, I want to hear. I want to hear. I don't want to hear voices in my mind. I want to hear it with my ears. So, so I, I will talk about I will talk about the verse. I will share, you know. And sometimes when I drive, I will talk to myself. And people think I'm, I have these nice devices in my car that I, it's a cell phone or something like that. But, but you, when, when, when you meditate on God's word and when I say it over and over and look at different angles, say it differently, it helps me to get a better perspective on God's word. So it's very important that we reflect on the word of God in our mind. And then the last one is we need to remember it with our heart. Not with our heads. With our heart. We need to filter through from our heads into our, into our heart. Now, I quickly want to make an illustration. Because if we really want to be man and woman of the Word of God, we need to do much more than what we are currently doing. Now, here's, here's a quick illustration. This, is, this, this resembles my, my soul, spirit. Yeah. And this tea bag resembles God's Word. Okay? So I'll put in some water. And this first tea bag, basically it resembles, say, so let's come to church every Sunday. We come to church and it's nice. And so I'll remember about 5%. So I'll just dip it in once. Okay. Can I say I have some tea now? Or is it still just water? So here's the reality. When you go back home today, there's very little change that has happened in your life. That saddens me, but that's the reality. Okay. Now, let's say for argument's sake, you say, well, I'm, I'm going to go to another service tonight somewhere else. Drop it in once more. The fact that you attended another service, did it increase your knowledge in God? 0.056% maybe. But 0 0.0 doesn't count, you know? But if I say, you know, I'm, I'm going I'm to bring a notebook and I'm going to bring a pen and every day we're going to write it, I'm going to listen to it, I'm going to meditate on it, I'm going to do some, some extra stuff. I, I want the word to become part of me. I'm even going to my life group this coming week and I'm going to make some time with my life group so that I can talk about it and read God's word and, 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 you know, um, just have more and more of God's word in me. And in my quiet time, I'm going to wake up every morning at 5, you know, get the right time. And I'm, I'm going to spend at least a couple of minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, depending on what you think, how much is enough for you. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to do all of these things. I'm going to have my notepad and I'm going to pray and I'm going I'm to share this. With other people at work and wherever I go. And can you see the difference? Can you see the difference? Now let's just let's just keep. Now this is like a week's work, a week's work, you know, consistent doing this for a week. Let's see if you do it consistent for about two weeks, three weeks, and four weeks, and five weeks. Let's leave it like that. Let's see how the substance of God's word filters through the water and give it a different color, different taste. Let's move on. The third one is we have to live in the word of God. We have to live in it. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart. For what reason? So that I may not sin against you. That's basically saying we have to memorize the word of God. If you memorize one verse a week, a week, you will know 52, week, uh, 52 verses in a year. And if you memorize for 10 years, imagine 
10 years times 50 is how much? 500 verses. I'm just... But how many do you know at this moment that you can recall? Because when you need God's word, many times when you need God's word, your Bible is not nearby. Have you, have you, have you come? Have you noticed that? And if you haven't hidden it in your heart, how can God recall it from your heart? How can he, you know, if it's not in your heart? The fourth one is, we have to grow through it. We have to grow through the word. Psalm 119 verse 18 says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your word. I don't know if, if you are like me. Sometimes you read the word of God and you read it. You read that passage over and over and over again. And then one particular moment when you stop and you pray and say, Lord, what is it that you want to say out to me? What is it that you want to say to me? And then that verse, it comes alive and it speaks directly to your spirit. Do we have a hunger like that? Do we have an ultimate hunger to grow in God? Say, Lord, this is my desire. Open my eyes. So that I may see you. So I may see the wonderful things which you have hidden in your word. Yeah. God has given so many promises. For every day there is a promise. Every single day God has set aside a promise for you. If you don't know that promise... Let's move on. The fourth one is, we need to grow. Let's sell the fourth one. We need to grow f- uh, through it. Now, in Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, there's the parable of the sower, you know? The guy that went out, sowed some seed, and there were four different ground types on which he sowed it. Now, the first one was the hardened soil. Now, I just want to speak about, I'm looking at this passage from a different angle, which is, you know, four different attitudes. So, the first one is the hardened soil, which basically... Refer to people with a closed mind. Closed mind means I've made up my mind. You get people like that. They even attend church. They even attend fellowship. But I said, I've made up my mind. I don't want this stuff. I don't want this word. You know, because I'm actually afraid. If I open this word and I read this word, God is going to challenge me on certain aspects of my life. And I don't want them. So I'll remain having a closed mind. So shut down. What is the action step? Cultivate an open mind. Say, God, here I am. I'm an open mind. I know it's scary. I don't know everything in this word. I don't. It's tough for me even to believe all of the stuff that is in here. Um, Some stuff I don't even understand. There's so many questions regarding the word of God. All I just know, I made a conscious decision. I believe your word from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation 22. I made up my mind. I have an open heart. I have an open mind. You can consume me with your word. The second soil is, you know, the, uh, the shallow soil. Basically speak about your superficial mind. It's like, how should I put this? You know, artificial and you know superficial. What's the difference between artificial and superficial? Artificial is fake, superficial is shallow. You, you, you look like you the, but deep down there's nothing. John Mbiti, he's an African theologian. John Mbiti, he said, Christianity in Africa is like a wide river. You can see it, but it's very shallow. It has no depth. Which means that sometimes people can see on the outside, oh, he dresses like a Christian, but his actions doesn't prove it. It's like, yeah, narrow-minded. What's the action start? The only way how God's word will become more and more and more part of us is what is when we spend more time. Is when we make time to spend more time with God. I, I, I want to say this. I think sometimes we look at and we say this is sin, and we look at all these things. But I think one of the biggest sin we are committing at this moment is not spending time with God. Not spending time with God. Not spending time with God. The third one is where the, you know, the soil with the weeds and a preoccupied mind. I come to church, I do this, even in the afternoon I read my words, or, or, you know, I read uh, my Bible and read my notes and I, 
try and make an action step. This is what I'm going to do. And Friday, I, Sunday evening, I even prayed. I had a nice devotion with my family. But come Monday, and I go to work, and all the frustrations at work and you know, stuff that I need to do. By the time that I get back home, I'm so frustrated. I'm so, I just go to bed, and you know, there goes my week. And Friday, I recall again, ah, oh, I didn't spend some time with God. But on Sunday, sun, Sunday, I've set aside this one day for God, and I will focus on it. I, I want to say, there's so many distractions that will come your way during the course of this week, and even during the course of this last six weeks. We need to eliminate all these distractions that keeps us away from spending time with God. All the excuses we make sometimes not to attend things or not to spend time with God, I don't I wonder how many of them will actually held up before God. Whether it would be an understandable or an acceptable excuse before God. And then we have the good soil, which is a willing mind, what's the action? Cooperate with God. Basically doing what God says. Doing what God says. Let's move on. Just two. I'm nearly done. The fourth one is we need to act on the word of God. James 1 verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word of God and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Do what it says. Do what it says. Because the action speaks louder than the words. Psalm 119 verse 105, it says, and that's the sixth point I want to make, we must trust in the word of God. It's difficult to trust the word of God, especially when, you know, everything is not clear. When you still have to, you know, take a step of faith and walk through this. But you'll say, I trust God's word. For the past 6,000 years, 2,000 years of the New Testament, it has been a reliable word. And I choose to trust this word with everything that is in. I don't understand everything, but I know this. God's word is like a lamb to my feet and a light on my path. I want to close up with a story. And before I do that, can you see the difference now? Can you see the difference? Is this still water? What is it now? That's the truth. That's the truth. It became tea. Now my question is, when people look at us, how much of Jesus do they see in us? Can they truly say, no, we don't see Patrick anymore. We see Jesus. I just want to make myself a cup of tea. You know, when people taste us, can they smell Jesus? Ooh, like a rooibos tea. God even said, come and taste and see that I'm good. Mmm. I... Mm. It's a simple illustration, but it has a powerful truth in it. How much, how much of God's word is in us? There must be a difference. People must see, taste, feel the difference. We can't say we are Christians, and nobody can see that we are Christians. Let me just close up with a story. There was these four guys, you know, on uh, New Year's Eve. Let's call it New Year's Eve. They had a long workshop and they're on their way back home. And they, rest, or they rushed to the airport. And when they came to the airport, they realized that they are really, really late. And their names have already been called. So they know that the chances are huge that they will uh, lose that flight. So they, they ran and when they entered the... All four of them basically stumbled over a, uh, what do you, it was, what do you for a, somebody helped me, a staliki. It was a course staliki. Fruit store, yeah. And they basically stumbled over this little girl fruit store. 
down South Africa. Okay. And then the four of them started, they, they just continued running. And as they were running, there was this one guy that said, just tell my wife and kids, I love them, I will be there on the next flight. And he turned around, he came to this little daughter, he picked up all her food, and put it nicely back. And then he said, he saw that there was a few dented, and he took up his uh, wallet, and he even paid for it. And he asked the little girl, are you okay? Is everything fine? And she said, yes. And as he walked away, this little girl asked him, are you Jesus? And he stopped in his track. Are you Jesus? Have you done something so tangible that a spiritually blind person can ask you, are you Jesus? If our vision is more like Jesus, and there's no trace of Jesus nearby. It's a clear, it's, it's proof that the word of God doesn't reside in us. As it should. I still remember one sermon. It was titled in Afrikaans. Now it sounds better in Afrikaans. So I'm going to say it in Afrikaans because I know there's a few of you that understand in Afrikaans. It says that, Was ik heilig of was ik skein heilig? And it basically says, you know, am, am I a holy person or am I just a reflection? Do I just portray to be holy? Oh. As Christians, we need to shape up. We need to, because here's the thing, here's the deal. Next week we're done with 40 days. Then you can tick off and say, I've done 40 days in the world. The question is, what have you done it? How much of the word of God is in you? That's the bottom line. Because if you tick it off and you say, I've done 40 days, that's religious activity. That's tradition. But if you move through this and you say, I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to continue to grow in my walk with God. I'm going to do Bible study. I'm not going to give God the crumbs. I'm going to give him the best time, the best I'm going to make a date with him every single day. I'm going to spend time in his life. You look so depressed. Don't, I, I didn't mean to depress you. Depress, press you. Okay, I didn't mean to depress you. I, I just have this genuine desire as a leader of the church, as a pastor of the church, that we will grow together in God's work, that we can transform our community so that we can give hope to the next generation. Because the next generation is looking at us. And what they see is they don't see Jesus, so why should they be attracted to Jesus? Because we talk about Jesus, but they can't see Jesus in us. Okay, 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 okay. Would you stand with me? Let's close off. Father, we thank you for the time that we could spend in your word. And as I rightfully said, Lord, my prayers, I don't want this just to be a religious activity. I want people's lives to be transformed. I know we cannot transform our lives on our own because popular culture and emotions and all these other things, we have drifted in that, and that's why we cannot see fruit because we're so entangled with the word with the world, and we just want to take the word along wherever we like it so that we can use it, but we don't want the word to transform our lives because we are comfortable with where we are. Please forgive us, Lord. Please forgive us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to fall in love with your word. And I realize the more time I spend in your word, the more I want to be in your word. Because time Spend with you. It's not time wasted. It's time invested. It's time that we invest in a relationship that are tangible, that, are, that, that sets the difference between tradition or religion and an intimate relationship with you. We opt for the relationship and not the tradition or the religious activity of it. And in order for us to do that, we need to know you. Holy Spirit, I know that if you are not part of the equation of breaking up the word of us so we can understand it, it's just going to be head knowledge. 
We need you to transfer that knowledge deep into our hearts so that it can go over into action. We want to we wanna adhere to this one scripture in James 1.22. We don't want to be just hearers of the word of God. We want to be doers of the word of God. So as we go and apply these truths, we know we will grow in you. We'll grow in wisdom. We'll grow in understanding. And that's what we want. So that we can make a difference and transform the people's lives that you've, that you've placed us in. We pray this in your name with thanksgiving in our, in our hearts. Amen.